Just to, to start off, Gordon, um, let's let's jump back then, since we were just talking about sixty three. Mm-hmm. Um, when when you guys, the three of you guys, were starting out, what? I know in, in, in one article I read about you wrote a paper that used the line cinema verte and democracy. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk to us a bit about those addition, those initial values that you guys came up with that were the core? And I mean, even after the, the guys left and it was you and, and Blumenthal that came through, right? Um, how that kind of expanded from there? Well, you know, we were we were all students at the University of Chicago, uh, which had no film school, but it had Doc Films, this film club, and that's where I met Temner uh, and Stan Carter, and we used to joke about someday we'd start a company called Kartemkin. We thought it sounded like Potemkin, <laughs> but I wrote my BA paper on cinema verite and a democracy, and I had seen. We were all really excited by these early verite movies that we're seeing. Happy Mother's Day by Joyce Chopra and Ricky Leacock uh, just blew me away. That was the first one where it was like, wow, that's what I want to do. And then we saw films by the Maisels brothers and by the French, Jean Rouche, Chronicle of a Summer. And this idea that you can go out and tell stories about real people uh, and, you know, sort of create draw audiences into a story that is out there not sort of reducing people to a you know an example of something in a film about a social issue Mm -hmm. but being a complicated story about human beings where then the audience can be drawn into the social issue that's that is impacting their lives Um, and so that really from the very beginning that was what I was interested in and what we formed Cartemquin to do uh, and it just evolved over the years in several different ways I mean it was the 60s the late 60s and so we you know very very quickly we were a collective by the time you know the end of the end of 68 69 we, we had evolved into this collective uh, eventually at its peak it was like 15 people or something and then we uh, that fell apart at the end of the 1970s uh, Jerry Blumenthal who you mentioned my producing partner all these years who passed away the year before last and we kept it going and now we've evolved again into a full-fledged media arts organization that started about 10 years ago we built a board uh justine nagan was the first executive director i stepped down really as the as the ed uh and became the artistic director uh and now we have a new ed and justine is now running pov but you know, we keep transforming ourselves with the period of history we're in. And I'm actually trying to finish a film that I was mentioning mm-hmm. to you, 63 Boycott, uh, that I shot when we were students. You know, Temner and I and Stan Carter, we were still in, at the University of Chicago, and there was this huge boycott of the Chicago public schools. The African American students all walked out because they were putting trailers behind the overcrowded african-american schools so they wouldn't have to move those kids into the adjacent underutilized white schools Mm. and that was just the final straw and it was the biggest uh demonstration in the north up until that period um and we filmed it somebody just said hey this is going to be big it's going to be historic and you guys should film it and so what i'm doing now we have this website 63boycott.com just the numbers 63boycott.com and you can go there and we've got 500 still frames taken from the footage and it's like facebook people can just click on their picture and identify themselves you know Mm. or if there's several people in a picture just like facebook you can this is me or this is my cousin or i know this person and then we've been tracking now people down and interviewing them uh and we'll interview we'll interweave the footage with the uh with the interviews about you know the kind of the impact 
of being as as young people being involved in that that great demonstration. You guys are expanding into a whole other technology. You guys have always expanded with technology, even though the heart of the stories has always remained. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's really about storytelling, and it's about your characters, and you know, the technology has changed. I mean, that was all shot in 16 millimeter film, and all of my early films were in 16 millimeter film. We showed this film about some labor issues uh, here that was done with the very first portable videotape recorders, the Sony Portapack. Yeah. You know, and it's a, it's a pretty crude thing, but it was a film when we were a collective. We were getting approached. People would, you know, we're working with organizations. We were making films about some labor struggles, but sometimes, often by the time we had the film done, the struggle was over. <laughs> workers had lost or whatever you know it was too late not really not too late I mean we put the films in a wider context and that's why we would bring his history and you know other kinds of analysis in of our film to make them sort of a broader story than just what was happening to these central characters mm. but uh, you can see that in a film like uh, the Chicago Maternity Center story or the, uh, the last Pullman car but you know these are carefully edited crafted films and with this early video technology, it was very crude, you know. And Bart and I were joking about you'd you'd wind it back three and a half turns from going from one, uh, you know, recorder to the next, and you'd get the two recorders going, and then you'd push a button and hope for the best, you know, about where the edit was going to be going onto a third recorder, because they all had to get up to speed, you know. They didn't just so it it but. The technology changes, but really at, at, at heart it's about finding characters and telling stories and entering into people's lives and then putting that into context. And I think in the early days, our very first film, Home for Life, which was done in an old age home, and I think we thought that if you just showed what was going on and reflected society back on itself, that would be enough to make social change. Mm. But we learned with that project that you have to do more than that because you have to really talk about power relationships in a society if you really want change to come out of it. And so Home for Life was quite successful, but it was basically used to make nursing homes better, mm. but it wasn't used to start the larger conversation about where old people fit in in our, in our society. And you'd reach that subject later on, I mean, with, like, uh, the Vietnam movie as well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I've, I've got to ask, it's kind of interesting with the maternity story and, and some mm -hmm. of those early works. The women's liberation was something that you guys put full front <coughs> in, in the organization and the collective. And it now we're at the 50th anniversary and we potentially could have a woman president. I mean, maybe not the woman president, <laughs> right. you know what I mean. But right. to see that reflection in not only the films, but in the America it you've got to feel like you guys have contributed so much to changing the the scope of things well I, th I think you know that we did I mean what happened in the 60s and 70s the whole movement <coughs> you know excuse me raised a lot of issues that we're still struggling about today you know I mean I think I was more amazed that we had an African-American president <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, having grown up in Northern Virginia and gone to segregated schools, you know, where everyone was in my school, everyone was white, the president of the senior class and uh, captain of the football team was Jim Hamasaki, you know, a kid in front of me in Spanish class was from Venezuela, but African Americans were by law in a separate school. And so, you know, it's, it's we, we fought a lot of battles uh, around race and gender and sexual orientation and all of those things that started to happen in the 70s. But you can see we're still fighting them uh, today and there's a lot going on. But it was, you know, I, and I think that media has played a role in that, that, that the kind of films that get shown here at the festival are the kind of films that, you know, we're always thinking about the, the, when you're an activist, the, the challenge, the most difficult challenge, is how do you speak to people who aren't already sympathetic with your issue or with the people who are portrayed in, in your films, you know? Mm. And Hoop Dreams was a real breakthrough in terms of that and really, you know, opened up a lot of things for us because 
that was a film that did uh, it reached a huge audience of people who would have never watched a film about a social problem as soon as they were like oh yeah right inner city problem i'm not interested inner city family i'm really not interested <laughs> you know but it was about sports and coming of age and family drama and all of those things drew audiences in and for us that was really important you know you mentioned uh, vietnam long time coming and that was uh, eventually broadcast on nbc and it was a high profile film it had some you know big people behind it and originally it was going to be in prime time and then we're called to this meeting in new york and you know and uh, we walk into this meeting and everybody uh, they seem uncomfortable nervous you know and they've decided to run it in a sunday afternoon sports slot you know and they thought we would be all upset you know and we were like well that's great you're going to you're going to reach an audience that really needs to see this film yeah. an audience of you know sports people and people who have been watching football and not thinking about the problems and struggles that veterans are having who are probably sitting right with them in the room watching yeah. the football game you know and so it was like hey we're cool with that you know it's we didn't need the cachet of being in in prime time and i think eventually we won an emmy I forgot what it was exactly for, but it was partly because we were in that sports slot, wow. uh, it, you know, afternoon slot. But we give a lot of thought to that kind of thing. How, where is the audience, where is the audience that maybe this film can help to open up a little bit and draw them in on an emotional level? And then once you've got them drawn in on that emotional level, you can then get them to maybe see either people or an issue from a perspective that they haven't thought about. Can you talk about, you know, in the beginning you guys had, um, you know, commissioned work. I mean, especially like the Catholic. Uh, the they, very they, early films were, were commissioned by Catholic yeah. Adult Education, yeah. And that was right before the collective. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're just starting out. We're right out of school. And we get this opportunity to make these films for Catholic adult education who wanted to talk about issues who were, these were films that were going to be shown in church, church basements all over the country and that kind of thing. But we were also, you know, I mean, you, you take your opportunities where you find them. So, you know, we were like, we'd been very influenced by Chronicle of a Summer and there's a famous scene in Chronicle of a Summer where the two women go around in streets of Paris asking people if they're happy and we're like, hmm, we're working for Catholics. How about two nuns going around? We'd pitch them these ideas, you know. And so a lot of those films were were influenced by that. And they were very interested in the generation gap. And we were concerned about the Vietnam War. And so we were like, well, we found these kids who were going to hold an anti-war mass in this very conservative, you know, northwest of Chicago neighborhood. And it was like, perfect you know we'll pitch them that you know as a way of talking about the the gap between parents and and kids and uh and it we really got it i mean it really brought out a lot of things and then when the as you mentioned that the you know kartemkin was always very influenced by the women's liberation movement the the beginning of the collective period was really when sue davenport and jenny mm -hmm. Rohr came to us with to me and jerry uh, and by that time, Jerry Temner had, had left. It was Jerry Blumenthal and Stan Carter would, had already gone in that first period. And they had this film they were working on about the struggle to save this home delivery center in Chicago and wanted help with their movie. They had been at Columbia College going to film school. And we were like, cool, you know, so we started working on it together. And it was the 60s. It was just, for us, it wasn't like we had this political vision you know or uh, uh, it was like people started coming around you know and Peter Kuttner showed up and had been working on a film about racism and Richard Schmeekin who went on to make the Times of Harvey Milk mm -hmm. uh, joined, joined our group so people were just attracted to the fact that we were it was that 60s period you know we would have two meetings a week about our structure and identity and political meetings. We were all reading Mao and, you know, we were, we were about changing the world, 
but also about changing ourselves and the way in which we related to each other. And so some of the people who were teachers or came out of being, they were union organizers and really didn't have film skills. So we were, you know, someone was reminding me of this in some other interview pointing out to me because it's like, back in the collective period we were very much about skill sharing and Dinesh just talked about you know he didn't really go to film school uh, he did study some film production at the University of Chicago uh, because a woman who had been in our collective Judy Hoffman now is a professor there teaching film production which is I went there too but when I went there it was like God forbid you should <laughs> do anything with your hands there was no production you know of any sort but you know we carry on that it, I don't really think of it as a tradition, but our intern program is a program where that Justine really developed, where every week there is a workshop for the interns, and it's in camera or editing or directing, but also in producing and fundraising and outreach and engagement, how you make a film have an impact. So they get these workshops from all different kinds of people, and Dinesh has even done them. He used to do... I for a long time I was obsessed with fair use and I would talk about that and so my workshop with the interns would be about fair use but then Dinesh sort of took that over you know mm -hmm. and he became uh, the fair use expert you know with all the the growth and the, the collective and how big it got you guys never left Chicago that never I don't know if it even crossed your guys mind it it did and really before the collective it was in those very early years we saw that the kinds of films we wanted to be doing were being funded on the east coast or the west coast and there really wasn't uh, there didn't seem to be the money or that much support for what we were doing uh, in Chicago when we looked into at one time we were thinking maybe we would move to Boston you know and try to work with WGBH and then we were like, no, we're Midwesterners, we're staying here. You know, by that time I already considered myself, you know, a Midwesterner. And we're, n we're not, we're going to plant our flag here and stay here. And in those early years, when we started getting our films broadcast on PBS, it was through, you know, uh, the, the national series. They would get shown in Chicago, but not through the local station. <coughs> now we have a great relationship with the local station, but back then it was sort of different. But we... It, it it worked out, and I we have no regrets about staying in the Midwest. And, and I think regional filmmaking is really important. You know, it's like we've done films. We've, we did a series, The New Americans, uh, yeah. that ran on PBS, and it's one of the greatest things we ever did. And it's, uh, you know, looking at people coming to America and really starting with them in their home country and spending time with them there. We wanted Americans to understand what people are giving up mm -hmm. and what they leave behind. And, you know, two of the stories are about people coming to Chicago. We have stories, you know, other ones yeah. on the West Coast, and we have other stories. It was supposed to have a national footprint. But if you're in Chicago, Chicago gets a little extra, or you're <laughs> in the Midwest, and, you know, that happens when you see things that are, you know, if people are on one of the coasts, often that's where their films will be set. And so... We, we think that regional filmmaking for the, you know, complex democracy like America is really important and that, that you need to have filmmakers in those locations telling those stories, which doesn't mean that people can't come in from the outside and tell a story. That happens, too. And we go other places and, and tell a story. We did a film about Leon Golub, the, mm -hmm. the artist, who is based in New York, although he began in Chicago, you know, his roots were in Chicago. But, you know, we traveled back and forth to New York while we were making that film. But, yeah, we, we, we definitely see ourselves as, I, I like to say that we, in our early years we were quite provincial. You know, the whole idea of film festivals, we barely knew what they made. It meant the first couple of foreign film festivals we were in, we were in the Edinburgh Film Festival, uh, and we were in the festival, the, our film, one of the Catholic films, opened the festival, the Popoli in, Rome, in uh, Florence. In, uh, the, it, I think it was right around 68. It was when the Godard and the Radicals mm -hmm. shut down the festival. And they, they were shutting down all the festivals across Europe. And our film was the opening night film. And a riot broke out. They, they, uh, they shut down the festival during our film. So there were all these funny reviews, you know, about how our our 
as they as some of them said our long and boring film but fortunately we didn't have to watch the whole thing because they they rose up and shut it down but i forgot where i was going with that oh about just we, we were kind of provincial we didn't even know you were supposed to go to the festival <laughs> you know we we didn't really understand you know and now of course we're much more sophisticated about that stuff you know i i want to you brought up the new americans uh I was born in Israel, and I came over with my family. So your film in particular really blew me away um, from a different perspective. I mean, obviously, yeah. I'm Jewish. I was from nowhere near where she was from, and I was... Or, that was or well, yeah. quite near in many yeah, ways. Exactly. What city? What, what city? Uh, just north of Jerusalem, so very yeah, close. Yeah, very close, yeah. Uh, but across a vast divide. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Jerry and I uh, directed that, uh, you know, a couple of nice Jewish boys, and, uh, you know, it was very important to us. We went, As we were all dividing up our, you know, who's going to do what and everything, and Jerry and I were always had our eye on the Palestinian story because we were like, uh, partly because we thought it was really obviously to, important to tell that story and to make Americans have an insight into the, you know, kind of the human quality of a Muslim family and all of that, which, I mean, prescient, because next, you know, back then it was pre-9-11, none yeah. of that was happening, though the 9-11 happens right at the end of the film, mm -hmm. you know, we we, uh, we thought we were done shooting, and then we were rushed out to be with our family on that day, but also because of the food. Yeah. We were like, you know, we're like, I think this is the, this is the culture we want to We have to go to Jerusalem. Yeah, we want to, I think we want to be enmeshed, <laughs> we want to be enmeshed in that. Uh, that was, uh, but... Yeah, I mean, I think that was a really powerful uh, thing to have done, and I think a little bit different way to tell a story about immigration, because, and it's probably part of what you were responding to, too, which is that people think, oh, everybody wants to come to America, and they're just sitting there with their bags packed waiting to come, and we were like, let's find people who, you know, Nirma had, uh, uh, she ha she was finishing school. She was still living her life. So you could see the world that she was leaving behind yeah. and understanding there were reasons why she was coming, but you also had some understanding of what people uh, gave up. And when we were, we did a, had a huge outreach and engagement campaign with that film and worked with all kinds of organizations. And Gita Sadie, who was a series producer, and I were had taken clips and we were showing some material to uh, these were all people from immigrant serving groups so uh, you know a whole range of, of different kind of groups and we were there to you know talk business and figure out how they were going to use the series and we were going to make these modules to be useful to them and everything and we showed these these clips and they were just you know we had to take a bit because they were all so emotional and mm. so worked up with what they have seen. And one of the most powerful things that, that many of them said was, you know, we've lived through this. They were almost all immigrants themselves, and we forget. And so when people come, and we're the social service agency, we're, and we're like, you know, so here's what's available to you, and what do you think about America, and you know, and we're not paying attention that people half the time they're not even listening to us because they're mourning what they left behind and we need to give them time and respect that process give them time to come to terms with with what it is that they've left behind and not just try to inundate them with all these you know possibilities and you know you're going to be able to go to school here and here's how you get your green card and you know and so it was it was a powerful moment can you talk about the relationship with television and with PBS in particular, and, and when you guys grew, I, I think you've impacted them maybe more than any other film group. Well, I mean, we've, we've certainly been a, a part of struggles with public television. I mean, I believe in being an activist in whatever field you're in, mm -hmm. whether it's medicine or media or, you know, and so if the field is not right, I, I'm like, well, we need to change our own world. You don't just, I, I was on a, a panel many, many years ago, and somebody asked me, you know, because we'd been getting some of our films onto public television, they said, well, what, what is it that public television really wants? You know, and I said, that's the wrong question. 
The question is, how do you make them want what you think is important? How Mm -hmm. do you make them want to tell your story? So I was, you know, Cartemquin and I were very involved in the lobbying that resulted in the creation of ITVS. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were recently involved in a battle with the Indy Caucus, and we, we reached out to organize the whole field of documentary filmmakers to protest the local stations that were about to move independent lens and and POV uh, off of their Monday night slot to Thursday night, which is the night that the stations reserve for their own, it would have been a disaster. It would have been the end of those series. And so, you know, we, we fight back and we've made some enemies over the years, but that's just comes with the territory and we just I, I watched earlier you guys program this other people's footage and you know we were very involved in the in the battle for to reclaim our fair use mm-hmm. uh, rights and it, it was you know there were everyone in the film vir- virtually who spoke all of the interviews were all people that I'd been involved in that struggle with so I think it's something that we at Cartemquin we try to draw younger filmmakers in you know it's not just about making your career it's about making the field uh, be a field in which you can do the things that really are important. You guys have gotten to go back to certain subject matters like uh, Leon. I mm-hmm. mean, you've done two films about Leon. Uh, can you talk about having the time to revisit mm-hmm. what you guys have done? You know, in many ways, we've always wanted to do more of that, but that film in particular, and that was Jerry Blumenthal, who really, we had had this huge battle with him at the end of the film about Mm -hmm. the ending, and we remained very close friends. We remained connected together all those years. And so, and also, we had had sort of made this film about an artist kind of at the peak of his career. He was getting, you know, a huge amount of attention. He He had become very successful. And now he was like, old (laughs) he was really facing mortality and so jerry really wanted to go back and make a film about that and so we did uh and we revisit the disagreement that we'd had at the end of the film and sort of we like to be transparent in our films we like to let the audience sort of we're not making these reflexive films you know where it's kind of like all about the process of making a film but in just subtle ways we like to let the audience know this is what our relationship to our subject was these are the kind of tensions that arose and so in that film we really got to explore that and that was really exciting and then it was originally going to be two films you're right but when we were in the editing room then we were like well maybe it should be like you know the first film and then part what we were going to cut down the first film you know and then sort of have part two and then we sort of said you know what i think we can just stick these two things together and we it's just crude we have this title that comes up the first film ends and then 13 years later you know and the second film begins uh, which is shorter you know but uh and it was like you know we just released it as a new film called uh, Gollum Late Works or the Catastrophes. You know, the first film was Gollum, yeah. and then l- we added on to the title. Smart move, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it, it, you know, this idea of revisiting your subjects, and I know Al Maisel at the end of his life was trying to do that too, and I had done some shooting for him where he was revisiting uh, many of the people who had appeared in his er- earlier films, people from Salesman yeah. and other people. Uh, and I shot some of the stuff uh, along with Judy Hoffman, uh, who had been a part of our collective. We were, you know, the, the Midwestern people. We were going with Al and shooting because he, he was going to be in it. So we wanted a, he, us to capture him, too. And Jerry and I had this proposal called Old Friends that really was a great proposal. We were going to go back and revisit all of the people from you know our earlier work mm-hmm. and make a film about that and we never got it funded but then when dvd technology came along this was before dvds as we would release the dvds of the older films we would some of the subjects we were still in contact with you know certainly the boys from hoop dreams and stuff yeah. but even the inquiring nuns, you know, 40 years later, we tracked them down. And of course, neither one of them were nuns anymore. <laughs> but we did an interview with the two of them, and it's an extra on the DVD. So, and, and Winnie Wright, age 11, and, and, you know, now we live on Clifton. We found them, you know, 40, some 45 years, 40 years later, and there's extras on, on the uh, DVDs. And so that's a wonderful technology 
for being able to, you know, people, well, whatever happened to those, you know, and it's like, well, we can not only can we tell you, but we can show you who they became. Mm. And some of those scenes are just wondrous. And when we went to interview Winnie, uh, she invo invited a lot of her friends over some of whom had known her when she was 11 you know and some of them were new friends but so first we did the interview with her and then we we no we we watched the film with her and all her friends and so that and then had a you know kind of group discussion uh that was quite fun and then we did the interview with her i've, I've got to ask since we just literally watched Anessa's film um can you talk about what you guys are doing for the next group i mean because you're you're making strives now to make this not just something that's lived 50 years but this could go on forever yeah i mean we would like uh to see you know we cartemquin has evolved into a media arts organization we have a board um we're thinking about secession on the uh artistic side we've done it on the you know kind of more the uh organizational and administrative side uh, which I'm not involved in anymore. And now we're thinking about, you know, how to bring uh, people in to kind of do what I do with the younger filmmakers. We have the intern program, which is which Dinesh went through and is, is quite evolved. And we've he's not the only intern that we've wound up making a film with. Uh, but then we also have our Diverse Voices in Docs program that we do in conjunction with the Community Film Workshop, uh, an organization that is... Uh, primarily African-American that's been around for also for a long time and we actually do this program in their space on the south side uh, to bring more people of color into uh, documentary filmmaking and, and to kind of work around some of those barriers so we're very focused now on the next generation of filmmakers in, in, in documentary and it also kind of connecting people to this vision that it's not just about your career it's not just about you know this particular film that you've made about this social issue but it's about creating that space for all documentary filmmakers so sort of orienting people to become media activists and really take responsibility for our own field join the organizations like the IDA that are out there that kind of thing so yeah we're we're you know, we th this is, year has been quite a look back at our first 50 years, and I'm not going to be here when we do this again <laughs> 50 years from now, but we're, we're really now focused on, you know, where do we go from here and how do we evolve? Because I do believe that you, you know, you don't want to be static. You have to be paying attention to the period of history that you're in and understanding kind of where how to engage with the democratic process in terms of what's going on now mm. i guess final question i've got to ask gordon you know you've you've mentioned in interviews some other filmmakers that you've really liked and films that impacted mm -hmm. you but um what what can you share with us some films that have impacted your life and just meant the most to you that maybe not even documentaries but just that have made you kind of look at the world differently you know when i was a a, a kid in high school I would uh, I'd have my mother's car and I would drive in to, to D.C. Uh, to go see, fo quote, foreign films or art films, what they called in those days, you know. And I was, you know, I remember seeing some Bergman films and, and there was a film uh, by Jules Dessin that really uh, I thought was incredible. He was one of the Hollywood Ten. I didn't know any of that history at that time, called He, Mo who, he who Must Die. And it was mm -hmm. the, the Passion Play, the Christ play story. And I've never seen it since then because I figured, well, you know, I got a feeling if I saw it now, I might be disappointed. <laughs> and so I've never gone back to that particular one. But I loved films that, you know, kind of made me feel something and that were emotional and drew me in in that way. Um, you know, and then when I started seeing documentaries, you know, and at that same time, I was also looking at feature films, you know, and, and uh, was, you know, Antonio and those kind of people uh, but it was the documentaries that really excited me I mentioned Happy Mother's Day I yeah. mentioned those films right at the beginning but then you know someone asked me uh, for something else kind of like a blog thing uh, you know well what's a film you know that that you know influenced you in those early years and there was one Cuban film called uh 
one way or another uh, mm-hmm. by a woman, Sarah Go- Gomez, that came out of Cuba, that was an ex- kind of experimental. It was taking actors and putting them into real situations. So it's a love story between a construction worker and a teacher. And he's in the union, and then they go off together. He's getting in trouble with the, his union. She's having her issues in the school where she teaches. And all of those are like real people, real meetings, you know, real kind of uh, conflicts. And yet she's got her actors in the mix of bits of it. And I just found it incredibly uh, interesting at the time. And I just read for this thing, I, I re-looked at it. And it's mm. like, you know, it's just ex- as exciting today. And it's kind of a lost you know, a, a lost film. And a film that I just saw, you know, a week ago. Uh, I met uh, a couple of women at a, a film festival and I didn't get to see their film at the festival and it finally came to Chicago called When Two Worlds Collide. Oh, yeah. And it's a film about the indigenous people really standing up to the government who are trying to take over their lands for resource and oil exploitation. And what what I really liked about that film, and it's something that we struggle for, is it's not just this romanticized vision of indigenous people. You get a sense of their organizational skills and their political skills, and they're also looking at the other side, and a lot of it revolves around this law and this aspects of this law that the government has passed and that they want repealed. And they take you, they don't shirk away from taking you into the complexity of the details of that kind of situation. And I think that's one of the things that's really important that we struggle with, which you want your documentary to be engaging and human and emotional. And at the same time, you want it to really be dealing with the complexity of the issues that are impacting people's lives. And so, you know, when when we do a film about stem cell research, uh, we really wanted the, our audience, w- the, what the arc of the film is the story of a single experiment that we follow from beginning to end over the period of a year. And there's this human interest story, this powerful human interest story at the center of it, a, a, a stem cell researcher, and a, you know, the head of neurology at Northwestern, who his daughter, teenage daughter is paralyzed in a skiing accident and he, he switches his research from Parkinson's and other kinds of things to spinal cord injury, Mm -hmm. you know, and she's like her dad. She's like, you know, very driven kind of person. She's like, hey, get over it, dad. You're going to, you know, call me in 20 years if you discover anything, but I'm off to Harvard. You know, I don't have time for for this. Uh, But we also follow an experiment so that the audience comes away from that film on a scientific level. Mm. understanding what stem cell research really is and what science really is. And that that complexity is something that's important in our films. And so I think, and you can see some of that in Dinesh's film too, yeah. where, you know, it's it's very layered. It's not just a film that sort of reduces his parents or his family to, oh, this is this is about mental illness. You know, we want a lot more of that complexity in our films. I love that the stem cell research is Northwestern, it's Chicago. Yeah, it's <laughs> exactly. It's Chicago. You, you, if you're in a place, you find stories there. And I think it's important. That's why regional filmmaking and that's regional film festivals. I'm a big fan of regional film festivals uh, like the Dallas Video, Video Festival because of that.